If it's okay, I'd like to get to know everybody here a little bit in the sense that this will be a conversation that we'll have rather than as much of me talking to you. So if you don't mind your name, and if you are the patient, the spouse, the whatever the case might be, where you're from, and why I should visit that place. Got a small enough group, so. Uh, my name's Al. I'm a 30-year survivor, and I live in the Tampa area, and you should, you should visit Tampa during Gasparilla celebration if you like to dress up as a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm Paul. I'm a survivor, 24 years. I live in, uh, in Ponte Vedra Beach, which is near Jacksonville, and you should visit my city because it is paradise on earth. Wow. <laughs> my name is Gary. I'm a parent of a survivor. Um, I'm from Sebring, Florida. There's not much in Sebring to see. Oh, no. <laughs> not a very good sales pitch. Don't be on the tourism board for Sebring. <laughs> Hi, my name is Myra. Um, I'm a social worker at Sylvester Cancer Center at the University of Miami. And you should come for the Cuban food. I lived in Miami. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I, I, you don't have to convince me. Oh. <laughs> um, my name is Abby. I'm a social worker from the University of Miami. Yeah. Um, you lived in Miami, so I guess there's no bargaining. No, not at all. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Elise, and I'm also a social worker at the University of Miami. Great. So I don't have to say anything about Miami. <laughs> this is the wrong time of year to visit Miami, though. Too hot, too humid. <laughs> My name's Edward from Las Cruces, New Mexico. Uh, Ten-year survivor, and you should visit Las Cruces because uh, we're close to Hatch, New Mexico, which has some great green chili. Oh, wow. I'll be in Albuquerque in October. So I've, I've eaten some of that Hatch chili. Wow. <laughs> You'll second that? My name's Russ Orlando, and it's Mickey Mouse's hometown. And maybe by August I can have the chilies again. And I'm only 17 months past transplant. Thank so you. So amazed by the 20, 30 and 27. My name is Fred. <clears throat> I'm a survivor. Um, one year, four months. Uh, I live in Boynton Beach. Uh, the reason you should come to Boynton Beach is because the weather is much better than the weather in Boston. <laughs> Hi, my name is Pat. Of course, my husband is the, is the uh, survivor. 16 months, and I live here in Orlando. Very nice. I'm Christine Donovan. I'm a psychologist at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, and it's warm in Tampa and humid, too. Oh, very nice. What kind of patients do you see at Moffitt? I do a fair amount of sexual counseling with uh, the men and women, and then see a, a lot of um, patients um, really for depression, anxiety adjustment, that sort of a thing. Great. So correct okay. me every time I say something wrong today, please. Oh, no. I, I'm confident there will be nothing that is wrong when you speak. <laughs> Absolutely not. I paid her $10 to say that, guys. <laughs> the check <bounce>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my name is Jesse Maddox, and I'm a 10-month survivor, and I'm from Orlando, Florida. Very nice. I'm John, a 17-month survivor. I'm from Quincy, Illinois, and uh, this is Dogwood Festival. If you like dogwoods, this is the right time of year to be there. Very nice. Hi, my name is Lisa, and I'm a um, spousal survivor, and I'm from Quincy. Good morning. My name is Jeff, and I'm from Palm City, Florida. And I'm a 15-month survivor, and uh, we've got some pretty nice beaches there. Very nice. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate you all being here for the opportunity to actually just chat about sex. So we know that sex is something that we ultimately see everywhere. I mean, this, to me, is the most astonishing change over the past two decades in this country, is that sex is thrown at you everywhere you look, and even when you don't. You're talking about sex being used in advertisements for everything from food to your insurance because we know sex sells. And at the end of the day, the unfortunate reality is despite being able to be hit in the face with some sort of a sexual innuendo, some sort of a sexual picture, something related to sex, we end up in the context of clinical care, rarely having this conversation. 
So I'm interested here in hearing from the folks who are the patients, who are the survivors of BMT. How often did your hematologist, your oncologist, your primary care, how often did they say, you know what, how's sex going for you? Has anybody who here, and even as a father, has anybody here heard of the patient, their spouse, their whomever, having that conversation with their medical provider about sex? Several times. Great. It was related to there being remnants of either medication or chemo in the semen. Okay. So more worried about yeah. So. Yeah, they went about as medical as you could go with sex yes, yes. and still talk about sex. Yes. And for the rest of you, that means that over the 30 years, the 10 years, the 15 months, the 17 months, you've never had a provider ask you how your sex life was? In a clinical study and a piece of paper. A clinical study and a piece of paper, that does not count. You had your hand up. I was told to have protective sex because they didn't want her to get pregnant to, and still didn't understand it. It's way past the time for either one of us to do that. <laughs> you look like you're about 27, so I can understand why they approached you with that issue. <laughs> yeah, that's troubling, isn't it? I mean, at the end of the day, if we think about this, we know, and in fact, the World Health Organization defines sex as being something that impacts quality of life for every adult in this world. That this literally is, well, it's the reason why you're here. And it is so integral to the relationships that you had, have, or will have moving into the future. This is not a case where because you or your spouse or your son or your daughter or your loved one or your patients had BMT, that sex stops. But that seems to be this assumption, or at least this cloud that uncovers, that envelopes all of the folks that happen to be here at this conference, which to me is absolutely astonishing that this occurs. Now, if we think about what we know from the literature, what we see is that among men who are sexually active, so we're not even talking about the men who are not having sex, that among the men who are doing this very activity, that there are significant issues for a large number of them, which is, I hope, something that makes folks here understand that you are not alone if you experience difficulty with just not being interested in sex anymore difficulty with the development and maintenance of an erection, difficulty with having a completely changed orgasmic experience. These are all things that are part and parcel for a good number of men in your position. Now, what we do know is that as we get older, we tend to have less sex. I mean, if you think back to when you were 17, 18, 25, versus in your 30s and 40s and 50s, that changes. But what about after BMT? So in one study, what they did was they looked at men six months prior to BMT who had reported regularly engaging in sex, and it was about 60% of these men, which is pretty on par with what you would expect for a middle-aged American population. What do you think that number dropped to after BMT? Don't look at the next slide. 10%. All right. The guy in the front, just in case, he cheated. He s moved his slides. <laughs> Not as bad. It was 40%. But that's a significant difference because you're talking about essentially one out of the three men who were sexually active prior to BMT discontinuing sexual activity subsequent to their transplant. Not having problems, completely stopping. That's one out of three. That's a lot of folks. And if for those of you who are seeing patients, that becomes a situation where if you see three men who have had BMT, 
one of them is likely to have stopped sex. Now, we know that there are significant risk factors before BMT for the likelihood that somebody post-BMT is going to have either problems with their sexual health or is going to discontinue sex entirely. And as I'm running through this list, I want you to think about for yourselves, for your loved ones, if you check off one, two, three of these items, and this is not a case that the more items you check off, <laughs> the better you are. This is a case where the more items you check off, the more your doctors should have been talking to you about sex. First is time since treatment, or time since your transplant. The closer you are, the more likely there is to a problem. The second one is whether or not you report pain, whether that be joint pain, general systemic pain. The more pain you experience, the more likely you are to have issues. Third is whether you have any mood disorders as well, whether you struggle with depression, whether you struggle with an anxiety-related disorder. The fourth, age. The older you are, the more likely you are to have problems. And finally, how good are you at communicating with your spouse or your partner? And this is before transplant. How good were you? Because likely, transplant doesn't improve the ability that you have to talk to your wife or husband or whomever. Now, this is probably something that I would be preaching to the choir for in terms of thinking about what are some really common sequelae or consequences of the treatments that folks here at BMT and Phonet tend to experience. So after transplant, these are all things that can impact sexual health globally defined, meaning it's all things related to sex. So we can think about things like hair loss, the fact that for 100 days, and when I say fear of, this is really your doctor's significant fear of where they keep you inside a very, very tightly controlled space. But it's not like on day 101, folks here are running out to Disney World licking poles and going, I'll be fine now. So the fear extends well beyond that 100 days. GVHD, creating symptoms specific for men that impact their ability to do things as simple as kissing their partner. And if you lose that intimacy, what comes as a consequence next? If you've had to receive chemo, a number of different chemotherapeutic agents used in men cause difficulty with erectile function. If you've ever had radiation therapy, this increases fatigue. And this idea where the man says, honey, I'm too tired to, is absolutely very common in this population. And so if we look at these common issues, whether they be related to d desire, the erection, the orgasm, the way that you look at yourself, then you build in layers of things like performance anxiety. And then you worry, potentially, for your spouse or your partner, whoever that person might be, of whether or not this actually could be something that hurts their partner. These are all these layers that get added into an event that already at start could be complex. And it's not a surprise that we see all of the issues that we talked about before. One thing that I really do want to highlight for a lot of the men is that their self-image is very much affected by transplant. That it is uncommon for a man in some way not to feel like they are different whether that's their physical appearance, if they've lost hair, for example, if they have rashes. But beyond that, there's this idea that perhaps if they've had some difficulty with erectile function, that they are less of a man now than that they were before. It's how you perceive your manhood and who you are is different now subsequent to transplant. That is an issue. And hopefully you, what you've picked up as we've started chatting about this idea is that sex is a really complex recipe. Now, this is, of course, not what you see. I mean, what you see when you see ads for sex is all you need to have is that, nothing else. Just somebody dressed very seductively, a blue pill, and we're set. Right? And if it were really that easy, 
then none of your doctors should have ever talked to you about sex, should have just given you an ad for Viagra and said, all right, we're all set. If you want to do it, here's a pill and we're set. But we know that it's actually not that simple. I hope. If we think about, at least in my mind, sex is a threefold recipe that we need to consider. And if you lack any one of these ingredients in the recipe, there is the potential for an issue. Now, these three ingredients, first of which is function, is essentially whether or not the engine is running. The second of which is desire, whether you actually want to go out for that drive. And the third of which is, well, you need to have the other person be somebody that you want to engage in a sexual relationship with at that moment. So this, this is, if we think about that, not as simple as whether we can start the car or not. Now, if we think about these three, I'm going to focus first and foremost on the function piece because this is the piece that is often ignored, as we've heard, by your providers. So that at least if this is an issue or starting to become an issue, that you are aware that there are ways that we can think about this. Now, before we get to that piece, I'm interested very much in how folks here have coped with the fact that they may have been struggling with sexual health for months, if not years, without real intervention from what I've heard thus far. So for the folks here, how has transplant affected your sexual relationships? lack of desire okay as in before transplant right. you felt more subsequent what have you noticed just no interest um, I noticed like before constantly thinking about it you know just natural um, noticing sexual images stuff like that and then after it took a few years after and then it's just I don't just have no interest at all does that bother you? Well, yeah, yeah, it does. Um, I think, uh, I mean, it, it's a little bit uh, relieving not to always be thinking about it all the time. You know, I think that's just natural for a guy. But at the same time, it, I miss it. I miss, I miss wanting, wanting to have it and to do it. The de I miss the, the desire that comes with wanting to find it and engage. Absolutely. Um, so I had uh, total body irradiation. So as part of that, for first year after transplant, I was very fatigued and didn't realize what it was until somebody else's, another patient's um, mom who was a nurse uh, did some research and told the doctors, you know, you need to test these boys for um, testosterone. So it just knocked out our testosterone. Um, he got some treatment and it, his body started making it again and my body never started doing that. So I've been on uh, replacement for 30 years um, and that, that was good. So that helped. And I've worked over the years with doctors to tell them you need to talk about this stuff. You need to say this stuff. The other thing they didn't tell me about was Oh, well, about a week before, they said, you know, if you ever want to have kids, we've been trying to keep you alive for two years, so we didn't bring this up, but you might want to bank some sperm for kids later. Yeah. By the time they said it, it was too late. So that had a big effect on later, um, which I had to find a partner who was understanding, you know, that if we wanted to have kids, that we weren't going to have them the normal way. Uh, so it's a lot about the partner and getting somebody that's understanding to, to hang with you there. I agree with you. And you bring up two things, and I want to make sure that I at least pick up on those two things. The first of which is actually related to what the first gentleman here said, which is that lack of desire. Sometimes it actually is related to the fact that your body stops producing or produces less testosterone. And that is very much an under-recognized an under-treated issue 
as a result of the treatment. So absolutely is the case. And the second thing that you brought up is it's an interesting conversation to have now. I wish that you had the conversation about fertility, which I won't talk about today, before you went in for your treatments because now you have to have that conversation with every partner you meet pretty early on that, you know, I, I, it's not that I don't want to have children. It's I can't have children. And then you have to explain why, which opens up this whole other Pandora's box of all of this history for you. And that's usually not a first date at Starbucks over coffee kind of a conversation you want to have. Absolutely. Anybody else? After BMT, uh, the desire was there, uh, but it became impaired by the functionality. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you begin to feel that you're not, I I'll say, fulfilling your, your partner. So it, it kind of forms a complete circle, and then you begin to lose desire. You've just checked off all three boxes on that recipe we talked about earlier. It absolutely is the case that if you don't have that desire because of the fact that maybe you notice a decrease in function, that then you start to have that performance anxiety and you worry about what you're doing with your partner. And so, you, of course, that any activity that we feel as though we don't do well, we, we stop doing it as much. Other folks? Okay, so we think then, what, what, what have you done? What have you done in response to all of these things that are worrisome? Anything? You came here. Well, I appreciate that. But that feels very, very underwhelming. I'm glad you're here. But gosh. What else? Well, I had a good relationship going into it, and that's what kept me alive in good conversations afterwards and um, understanding and, and trying to work things out. And uh, so the relationship part of the recipe has been really, really good. Um, but I think on the desire side, there's probably something medically there, uh, whether it's testosterone or whatever else. And then graft versus host has just all sorts of complications. Um, so my graft versus host attacked my, my mouth, my eyes, my skin, my liver all at once. I did both acute and chronic all together. <laughs> I don't know, I just like to stack things up. And yeah. But getting over it's a lot, lot longer process. Nobody else has tried anything? Well, good golly. That's the case where I just shake my head and think, why? Why is that the case? So if we think about what we do related to the function, remember I said I'm going to take on that piece first and foremost. There are a number of steps that are important to think about related to function, and they get heavier and heavier in terms of dosage. And I don't mean more medication. I mean more stuff involved, that there's just more heavier hitters, which is good from the perspective that there are more and more solutions for you to consider. So these are conversations that for folks here, I want you or your spouse or your children to have with your medical providers and thinking, okay, well, what do we do? So starting at the top, the top, 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 this is stuff that every American should be doing anyways, which is thinking about modifying reversible causes as a result of aging just natural aging. So we're talking about whether or not you can change medications that may affect things like desire. So some SSRIs, which are used for people who struggle with anxiety disorders or depression, can absolutely reduce libido or your desire to have sex. If that's the side effect you or somebody you know is experiencing, it's worthwhile to talk to the prescriber to say, this is something I want to have back. Can we switch to a different medication? Lifestyle modification, thinking about things like being more physically active, managing your diet better, because these are all things that we know improve energy levels for those folks 
who are fatigued. It doesn't make the fatigue go away, don't get me wrong. But let's just say it makes it 10% better, and that 10% might allow you at 2 p.m. to have the energy to be with your partner. Or, as you had mentioned, whether or not some form of hormone replacement is important to think about as part and parcel of this treatment that you've had. Now, typically what is recommended is that this doesn't start the day after transplant. It's usually not advised until at least a half year after the fact, and typically up to the two-year mark after your transplant. But these are all conversations that can be had with your transplant doc. And he or she may be referring you to another specialist. But for testosterone replacement, there are options, whether it's a patch, whether it's a gel, whether it's an injection. These are all viable solutions to at least talk about. Yes? Is it okay? It is, is it okay to take this testosterone replacement for years and years and years? For it's a good question, yeah. So typically, well, you may be best primed to answer this question because you've been taking it for years and years. I hope so. I've been taking it for 30 years, and every form that they ever come up with, I've tested out and tried out. So, um, yeah, they give you all that, like any medication, all these problems that it could be and stuff. Um, fortunately, I haven't had any of those problems. So, Thank you. So, so it's okay to take it forever? Well, I will say this. So he was asking for those of you who didn't hear if it's okay to be taking this forever. And the answer to that question is we don't know in that we've never actually, there aren't a lot of folks who've taken some sort of testosterone replacement for 30 years. And there are no really good studies to show what happens if you do take it for 30 years. In the same way, I'm going to answer just like for drugs that we typically think are safe, like some antidepressants. They don't study the long-term impact for somebody who's taken them for two decades, for example. So it would be a conversation to have with your provider. And I wouldn't worry yet about 30 years from now. I would worry about right now, if this is helpful, what's the next step if we come off it, if your concern is long-term side effects. And then the first level, if we go back here, if we think about the first-line therapy, all right, the first course of what might occur are vacuum erection devices. Has anybody used one before? What was your experience with one? Um, not very satisfying, not very good. Um, so that was one of the things where the testosterone is important to know it's replacement. So it's just replacing your normal level. It's not like um, you're playing baseball and trying to hit home runs out. They were overdosing with testosterone. So it's more just getting you back to your normal level. And then as far as um, the ED just hit me a couple of years ago, but I think it's more of a combination of uh, becoming diabetic. Um, and that's probably that. So, so that would be where we talk about, if we talk about this last page, reversible causes. So for somebody who is diabetic, thinking about weight management, managing the diabetes better. Also, we know that ED is an issue, if we think about a rule of thumb, is that by about age 50, about 50% 50 of men have some form of ED. By age 60, about 60% 60 of men. I mean, this is a case where, forget about transplant. Just age results in increasing likelihood of erectile dysfunction. Now, I'm sorry to hear that the vacuum erection device didn't work for you, but often, it's, like, it's, it's an incredibly simple premise that people screw up a lot. Not to say you did, but in terms of the patients that we see, I'll explain it for folks here. So, the development of an erection is a very simple physics event. It really is. Blood rushes into tissue that causes it to stiffen and maintain an erection. That's really all it is. And if we think about physics, what the vacuum erection device does with almost 100% success is it creates a vacuum. So what you do is you have to shave the hair around the base of your penis. You put a ring at the base of the penis before you put on the vacuum. Then you suck all the air out of the vacuum, just like in this picture right here. What happens if you suck air out of something? It forms a negative pressure. 
and blood rushes in. That ring at the base of the penis prevents the blood from then flowing out quickly, which means at the physical level, it is really, really good at allowing you to develop an erection. And I use the word develop a little loosely here. So you can absolutely create an erection. However, there are important caveats. As you can imagine, the process by itself is a process. You have to, if you are intending to have sex, you can't just go, hold on, honey, let's go. It's hold on, honey, get the device, put everything on, pump the air out, have it happen. Also, important to note, the blood that comes into your penis when you use this device is venous blood, which means it's flowing back to your heart and it's cooler. It's not warmer, which means the erection that you actually have as a result of using this is going to feel different. And notice I'm using the word different, not worse or better, it's different. So for partners who use this, that's where I often hear the surprise the first time that it's used when they touch their partner's penis and go, oh my goodness, it's not as warm as what I am used to before. However, from a simple physical level, this is absolutely the cheapest and easiest way of developing an erection. Now, when folks ask which one to buy, there's a billion on Amazon. It doesn't really matter. I mean, they, I'm sure they come in like some space grade quality materials and you don't really need all of that. It's about comfort for you, for your girth, and about essentially durability of the device. So if you find one that is well reviewed, that is sized to the appropriate girth and length of your penis or your partner's penis, there's really no reason to spend triple the money to get something that is sold and packaged nicer. So this is line one. Yes. What happens when you take the cylinder off? How long does the erection last? Great question. So it will vary. Of course, the tighter the ring is at the base of your penis, the longer it'll last, but the more discomfort there will be. The looser it is, the more natural it feels, but then the quicker the blood rushes out. Typically what we find is somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes, which, well, I mean, there's some other guys over here, I don't know if you can see, they're shaking their head going, oh boy, that's not long enough. <laughs> and I'm not gonna comment on the fact that somebody sitting next to you was laughing when you went back. There are a few questions I'll ask her afterwards, though, in the privacy of our conversation. Yeah, certainly long enough for, I would say, for most male penetrative activities, to put it uh, bluntly. Now, this came second for me, and this comes second for me because this comes associated with a number of different complicating factors, whereas the vacuum erection device, like I said, is a one-time purchase. Somewhere between 50 and 150 bucks is typically what we see for a good quality device that can last. Oral medication, however, thanks to all those ads that we see in TV and in print, is what most people think of as first line for me at second line for this first wave of treatments. So these are things that we're familiar with, whether it be Viagra, Levitra, Cialis. And essentially what these drugs do is they get blood flowing in your body. That's, like I was saying earlier, all the event is, is just blood flowing into your penis. Now, this is something that's important. If you take a Cialis, you don't suddenly become horny, all right? You just have the ability to develop an erection better because there's more blood flowing throughout your body. It also doesn't change your ability to talk to your spouse. If you and your spouse are pissed at each other before you take that Cialis, you will still be pissed at each other after you take that Cialis if there's more blood racing through your body. All right? That's a issue that often presents itself as people take it thinking, okay, now we're just going to have sex. And if their husband or wife is just sitting there going, oh, I'm still not interested in you, it's not going to fix that piece. Also, if there's nerve damage, often for men who have had prostate cancer, who've had surgery, even nerve-sparing surgery for prostate cancer, 
which is a bit of a misnomer because it's sparing, not completely non-damaging. This could be an issue. And for some men post-transplant, it just doesn't work. And there are mechanisms that we don't understand very well for why that might be the case. There are side effects. If you have heart conditions, typically you will have to see your cardiologist as well to make sure it's okay. And this shit is expensive too. Most insurance providers do not cover this. I'm pretty sure that Medicare Medicaid, for those of you over the age of 65, it does not cover this medication, which means you're talking about hundreds of dollars out of pocket for each pill. In Massachusetts, for our patients, what we've seen typically is it's anywhere from 100 to $200 per pill. So if you think about that, uh, I gotta say, I mean, I don't know what's like here in Florida, but if the thought of having sex is a hundred dollar bill, I'll tell you what, a lot of guys are thinking, huh, rather go to that baseball game. <laughs> it's pricey. So these are all things that can be effective. Now, most providers are able to give you samples, especially urologists. So at least if it's something you're considering, get a few samples, try it out. The next piece that builds upon this is the use of injection therapy. There are often things that men cringe at, and this is one of them. It essentially takes the active ingredients in what you just saw with the oral medications, but when you take something orally, it goes all over your body. It's systemic, right? The injections, often with things called trimix or bimix, you take a diabetic gauge needle. Before you're interested in having intercourse or some form of sexual activity, you inject this into the base of your penis. You don't seem to be a big fan. <laughs> what I will say, and it is the case that about a third of men will report some pain. At least where we practice, we have often nurse practitioners who actually train all of the men on how to safely inject. And it really is the case that it, this is a dog whose bark is worse than the bite. That when trained properly, it should not feel worse than when you go and get your blood drawn, for example. And because it's localized, it absolutely is more effective for men with worse ED than the oral agents. However, there's also a limit on how often this can be injected, which means if you are somebody who's having sex a lot, perhaps not the best resolution, or who hopes to have sex a lot. In the similar vein, you can actually transurethrally administer the medication. It's using an applicator that is actually introduced where you pee through that particular tube. In the same way, this also for a number of men is considered, ooh, doesn't feel too great. Similarly to the use of injection therapy, when trained properly by somebody experienced in this delivery, it's very toler well tolerated by patients. And then building up to the last line of defense, this is the only treatment that is irreversible. However, this is the only one that 100% guarantees the ability to develop an erection. It's a prosthetic. Essentially, you create this reservoir inside of your penis after some tissue is removed, and there is a button. You're almost like a little robot now. And if you push a button, it inflates. You push the button, it deflates. But like I was saying, if you choose to go this route, I would not advise it to be the first one that you go to before trying anything else if erectile dysfunction is an issue because you cannot go back from this. However, it is very much something that is incredibly well reviewed by men 
years after the surgery because it really is an erection on demand. It's not natural in the same way that the other ones are, but it absolutely is the case that men who've chosen to go this route are satisfied with their decision. Yes? Can I ask ask a question? Absolutely. Um, Can you rate those series of uh, options on sensation? On sensation meaning? Uh, Sensation with sex. As in, would you feel the same thing whether or not you've taken an oral agent versus an injection, for example? Yeah, so typically for everything up to this point, there is real no difference in terms of sensation because we're not actually affecting the nerve endings. We're not changing anything to do with the structure of your body that actually perceives whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. In this case, there is the risk when you have any surgery in that general area that some nerves may be damaged. Again, this is so well tolerated and so positive after the fact that typically for most men who've had penile prosthetic surgery, they do not report significant changes to sensation, but there is an increased possibility for this that there might be. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yes. Same question, except what about orgasms? It's a great question as well. Now, the orgasmic experience, where do you think that lies? Is it your question? No, it's not. My wife's sitting here right next to me. I was was trying to ask you, who are you thinking about during sex? (laughs) Tell us now while your wife is here. (laughs) And the answer is, it, it was absolutely, the, it's, it's here. It's perception. In the same way that we perceive pain, and that's a com, not a completely, but a very much a sensation that we perceive here as opposed to through just what we physically feel, the perception of pleasure, and then that interpretation of pleasure is here, which means, and if you think about, you know, like a, 15-year-old version of you who managed to have orgasm without any stimulation when you woke up after a wet dream, it is the case that if we're ranking these in terms of your ability to have an orgasm, they really don't affect whether or not you're being stimulated. And that question related to desire and then whether or not you may climax is removed from this function piece. So... If you're somebody who says, you know, if I have to inject my penis, I'm just not going to be turned on at all, well, that kind of answers the question for you. But importantly, that has nothing to do with the function, which is what all of these pieces are talking about. Now, the desire piece, which was something that somebody else had raised, and just a nice transition from what your question is, this is something that what we often see in this group is because immediately after transplant that they're not having any sort of intimacy. I mean, you're not kissing your partner. You are not touching your partner in the same way that it becomes something that you become accustomed to. That couples who may kiss each other every day are not now doing it, and so it becomes the new normal. And if we think about that premise of using it or losing it, it's the case where the longer you go without using it, the longer you go feeling comfortable with any sort of sexual intimacy, and I don't mean sex, I mean intimacy, the more comfortable you are not receiving or giving it, which then just makes it less likely you will want to be intimate the next time you may think about it. And that's a very common challenge for folks post-BMT. So of course we want to do things like rule out medical causes, rule out whether or not this is work-related stress, whether you're fatigued because of your two jobs, perhaps, whether there's issues related to depression, asking yourself that question that we had raised earlier, this is related to your changes and how you view yourself. If you are not confident in what you look like, in what your ability to perform is, this is, of course, going to impact your desire to have sex with somebody. Whether you have pain, as mentioned earlier, whether there are medications on board that affect all of this, I mean, I'm willing to bet that for the majority of men in this room, even those who have never had BMT, 
there is some item on here at some point in some sexual interaction with a partner where one of these pieces plays a role. So it's about revisiting this list and thinking about, well, how many of these things are chronic issues for me that I need attention for in order to better understand desire for myself? And then the relationship piece that we talked about is important. You mentioned earlier this need to have a conversation with somebody who just started dating about something related to sex that has nothing to do with sex in the sense that it doesn't have real impact on that actual encounter that day, but will in the future. And this idea that having this conversation is, is tough. I can assure you that I've never heard a man say, you know what? It was really easy to talk to my spouse about my erectile dysfunction. It was like talking about whether or not we're going out for dinner tonight. No one says that. I mean, this is part of a man's identity that they've developed since they were teenager. And you're talking about 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of an ability to do something that they identify with being a man that is lost, that now they have to recalibrate to that is a really tough and difficult place to start a conversation with. So for partners or spouses or parents here, this is something that you have the opportunity to engage in a conversation with to hopefully lessen the challenge of having your other half struggle with that conversation. And finally, we think about this, and for many of you here, you've heard this idea that post-BMT, that this has to be this new chapter in what you do. When it comes to sex, this new chapter is not in the same way for other aspects where you feel sort of forced to have to write this new chapter. This is one that I truly believe is a viable and a good new chapter in the sense that if we think again, when you were... Well, we rewind back to the first time that you remember it for the men here. Before you had sex, I'm assuming the first time you were physically intimate with a partner, it wasn't like you jumped straight to sex. You skipped the making out. You skipped second base. You skipped third base. You just went all the way home. That's all you did, right? It didn't happen, I hope. That would be really strange. Well, before you had sex, was it pleasurable to do all of the other things that led up to sex? Probably, I hope so. In fact, you were really excited to do all of the other things that weren't sex. And yet, as adults, what do we do really well is you joke about 10 minutes not being long or being long enough. But if we think about that, that's really what we do as adults is we go for the, the, the end zone is really all it is. We think about, okay, how do we get to sex? Once we're done sex, that's it. So all of the other stuff that comes with pleasure related to sexual activity that you've enjoyed previously, that we now skip over, are these things that you actually, I encourage strongly, you to plan time for as a way of building into sex, that the process in this case truly should be as fun as the end goal, and that's important. Now, there are resources available, whether it be Sexuality After Cancer, SexHealthMatters.org, Cancer.org, that if you go and find this material, there is literature out there that will help you think these things through with your partner, whether you choose to work with somebody who's, there are a number of good sexual health therapists in the community, or you have this conversation with your medical staff about some of these other issues, whether they be mood-related, whether they're fatigue or pain, and managing those, I strongly encourage you to make this part of your care after you leave. Thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to chat. So thank you, Dr. Zhao. Um, fantastic. Thank you. Um, we would like to take some questions. We would very much like to be the, these questions to be recorded so because there is a, this is being broadcast or not broadcast but recorded for your access later. So if you have a question, we'd like to get a microphone to you if you have a moment. So going back to that slide, we had the three pieces of the puzzle. 
you know, over the years I've found when you're young it's easy and it, it, you don't even think about it, it's automatic. But as you get older, I found that the more important part of that puzzle is the relationship part and the understanding partner. That um, you, know, you might not feel good about yourself and you might have your doubts, but if that partner picks up on that or that partner can understand that, you can work with it. You're absolutely right. And that's why it's important here, and I thank you for echoing that sentiment, that this idea of having a conversation with your partner who often understands the challenges, but that we've never had that chance to connect and actually talk about it, because it's something that we're afraid of discussing, is so important. I'm glad to hear that you have a supportive partner. Um, also, with the low testosterone, you know, you hear it on the radios all the time now and stuff like that, but it's, it affects your, affects your mood. Yep. It affects your fatigue. And, and you're tired and you're maybe depressed a bit, so you don't even realize that you're going along at this low, your engine is just tugging along slow and stuff. And getting that treated, getting that looked at, that just really revives you and brings back your fun and your light, fun into your life. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that your providers, or your friend, I think, had suggested that you at least get that checked. Absolutely. These videos are going to be available online? Uh, the videos are going to be available online. Is that, are the videos going to be available online? I think yeah, so. Uh, four to six weeks. Oh, I, about I here. think it's an audio. I don't think it's a yes. video. Oh, yeah, okay. So audio. audio. Well, I, I use the, um, the gel, and I find that if I don't use it, I get fatigued and tired and... Um, a little depressed maybe and if I take one pump a day it keeps me about stable and if I take one to two say and if I take three a day you know the desire returns if I take four in a day I'm running around the house naked you know? so, <laughs> so you you know I find the testosterone replacement and I've been doing it for probably 20 years, and, you know, depending on how much you take, it will restore desire. Not so much capability, but it maybe maybe some um, additional capability by taking more. But I find the testosterone to be a really good product, and it help. You know, I take it because I want to feel like a man, I want to look like a man, I want to have a man's body, I want to have a man's strength. And I want to I want to continue to function as a man is the reason I take it. And I've been taking it a long time. I do have concerns about its long term use. You know, what if I take it another 10 years or 20 years? I'm planning to outlive Simon. Um, I'm I'm planning to beat his record of 46 years since he was transplanted. Simon, I forget the man's last name. Bostic, yeah. Um, so I was. But you say there's no data on long-term effects. There's no effects. good data, there's yes. no good data on long-term effects. You're talking about 30 years post. Well, I'd be glad to sign up for a long-term study. That and would I'm be sure great. Alan here would as well. So. And I appreciate you saying that. The one thing that you brought up that I want to emphasize is that this testosterone piece, which affected your ability to have desire, did not impact function. And that's important, as we saw earlier, in that there is not good expectation that if you truly have erectile dysfunction, that improving desire is going to make the engine work. It's, if you think about that silly analogy related to the car, if I really want my car that's broken down to work, I can't will it into working. I actually have to fix the car's engine. And in this case, the erectile dysfunction piece will still have to be thought about as well as this desire piece. But thank you. Um, I assume there's a test to check your testosterone level, and if so, is there like a baseline? Is it age dependent? And do you keep checking it as you're on testosterone throughout the years to make sure that you're hitting that baseline? And or or, or and is there overdosing precautions or yes, 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 like and that? yes. So to all of those questions, yes, 
This is a very, very simple conversation to have, even with your primary care, but I would advise that you do it with your transplant team because they may have some concerns associated with testosterone replacement therapy for you, depending on what other treatments you may or may not have received over the course of your treatment period. So I would bring it up with them. And yes, there are age-related minimums, but that's a norm. You may do well with something higher or lower, but that's a conversation to have with somebody on your team. And there's usually an endocrinologist who specializes in this somewhere within your center. So absolutely. I think you may have answered my question. I wonder who is the best to talk to, your general doctor, your, uh, your BMT team, so uh, or your, 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 uh, um, your um, or the loss for words. Your, you, well, primary care, your, your BMT, and your oncologist. Yes, I would raise it. It seems like that qu- they, they, they're ready to run out the door the minute you start to bring something like that up. Uh, it just seems, I don't like, they're uncomfortable with it. You, you know, know what? So. It's a case where if, uh, yes, I understand where your challenges have been in that there are cases in which providers kick the can down the road a little bit. I would start with your transplant team. And if not, if your next appointment is with your oncologist, I would raise it with him or her then. Those two I typically say are one and one A in terms of who you should bring it up with. You should absolutely let them both know, but it would depend on who you're seeing or feel more comfortable talking to. And if you do feel like the transplant doc is kicking it to the oncologist who says talk to your GP, I'd put them all on an email and say, let me know, folks. What do you want me to do? A urologist is typically part and parcel of your plan if this is related to ED, and he or she is often capable of assisting you with all of those treatments we talked about related to function. Some urologists talked about testosterone replacement, absolutely. Maybe it's just a product of the system I work in where there's a specialist who sees left-handed African-American men who have erectile dysfunction because that's what they can specialize in since it's Boston. Um, But I would, again, start with your transplant and your oncology team and see if they have, maybe they work with the urologist, so. Um, Let's take one more question. Is there another question? All right, well, thank you, everybody, for the pleasure.